be hosting uh, this event to celebrate the launch of the Semiotex box set in Schizo Culture. Uh, this publication provides a fresh perspective on both the Schizo Culture Conference organized in 1975 by Silver Lodstringer and John Rashman and the issue of the Semiotex periodical published three years later under the same title. Uh, the box set includes a reprint of the journal and a book of transcriptions, documents, and responses to the conference edited by Silver and David Morris. Uh, so we're very pleased tonight that Silver has brought together a great group of contributors to, to this event uh, to reflect uh, in varying ways on aspects of schizo culture and the manner in which this term was enacted at the conference and on the pages of the journal through the collision of French philosophy and the activism and experimentalism of New York's downtown scene. So shortly, I'm going to hand over to Penny Arcade, who will MC tonight's event. Uh, but firstly, I just wanted to highlight that over the next few days, uh, the selection of archive material and audio recordings uh, for the present in the bookstore you might have seen on your way in. Uh, the, I the iPads that you see on the side there have uh, the kind of audio recordings from the 1975 conference. Not all of them, but most of them, and they're fascinating to listen to uh, as a problem and just read the transcription as well. Um, and, and also, alongside that, as we're showing Mary Patton's work, panel from 2014, that is based on one particular session of the 1975 conference. And so there's also asked me to mention that any interjections, questions, and observations are welcome throughout the course of tonight's proceedings. Please don't hold back. So I'll hand it over to Penny. Um, please join me in giving a tremendous amount of applause to Silvera Ginger for his birthday question. In 1996, I was doing um, a pirate radio station uh, in the East Village, and I invited uh, Silvera to come on to my show. And at that time, um, I was doing a lot of housing activism. Uh, it was a time when they were tearing down the squats. And I asked Silver, what can we do? What can we do? Look at the erasure of history. Look at what's happening. And it, and it hadn't even really started to happen at that point. I mean, it had been happening since 19... 81, but you know who's counting. But at that point, for me, it was really critical. And Silver said, "Penny, it's only in the cracks now." <laughs> so the culture that we love, that we thrive on, that has brought all of us together here tonight, is only in the cracks. And artist space tonight, with Silver, with Semiotext, is one of those. Cracks. So welcome, we're all here together. So the very first person will be Lodovico Pignati Morano from Milan, who will be reading a passage from his first fiction, Nicola Milan, published last week by Semiotex. Lodovico. suddenly or gradually, one cannot know. But, like any person who leaves without imagining a future, because, like a criminal, he's too euphoric with the sensation of escaping, he would have been struck, at least momentarily, by a fear that was completely borderless. For a moment, he would have felt that he would never be able to go home, that there was nowhere he could live but the place he now ended up in. In his motel room, Continuously going to check the shades as the sun came up after one of those nights that he didn't think ought to end yet, his mind would have started barking at him angrily. What were you thinking coming here? His first reaction to this outburst 
would have been to look around to see if anyone was there who would notice his distress. His first thought was being caught in that situation of panic. He would have wanted to keep the whole thing as quiet as possible. Then, assured that this moment was the correct one, he would have turned his eyes slightly inwards. He would have sat down. Then, he would have begun to listen. Outside, at that hour, he would have heard all kinds of different noises. Noises that were occurring for all different reasons. People returning home from parties. Others waking up and putting their coffee machine on the stove. Two motorbikes racing each other up a long straight strip of nearby road. Cats breaking open a garbage bag left outside a restaurant. Rats waiting behind the corner. There would not yet have existed, amongst all these different elements, a consensus to begin the day. He had only said one thing aloud to himself that morning, only made a single noise, after having sat there for a while. He said, with vain pleasure, as he instantly saw from what position he was saying it, as the expression jumped out of him and he felt its wonderful potency, I need to get the fuck out of here. He wouldn't have moved a muscle. The expression would have reverberated in his thoughts, through his motionless body, thrilling him, intoxicating his intellect. When he had said it, the expression had contained its full drama, terrifying, real, empowering. As he lingered in the drama of what he had just said, he would have understood quickly that he didn't really need to leave, that that wasn't the point. What had actually happened was that as he said those words, he had come into a new kind of power. He had acquired the ability to use the metaphor of a kind of movement, the metaphors of exile, of escape, return, secrecy, ambush. He could take all the time in the world, he now saw, to understand what leaving might mean, how to make it work best, how to model and refine the gesture, how to perfect its form, only then would he depart. Realizing this, he would have slouched in his chair a little more comfortably, feeling like he suddenly had a set of extremely valuable objects with him in the room. A small velvet lined black box of knives, or heirloom great Swiss watches. He felt, with greedy excitement, basically, that one feels immediately after acquiring what one likes to hold before him in all this world. What becomes clear then, the more one looks, is that at some point he decided to go home. But, subsequent to this realization, this acquired metaphor, he made the further decision to delay coming home. More precisely, he planned a detour. About four months or so, it seems. Four months of conscious detour, almost certainly all spent in a fort city of China. Four months or so in another foreign hovel, a crack house without crack. He wrote to somebody describing his accommodation. Counting down the time to his return with a strange aching in his body. A desire that he left untouched to cry about himself. Intoxicated by what it felt like to be about to leave this. The sudden blank blankness surrounding both his past and future. He arrived at the airport early to his flight to China. He went through customs immediately and began roaming the long hallways looking at the different flight destinations. Istanbul, Porto, Beirut, New York, Qatar. He was wearing baggy drawstring waist trousers made from loose linen for traveling comfortably. Underneath, though, he felt greasy and dirty, as if he had a plane behind his throat in the morning. Turning around, beginning to retrace his steps back to the center of the terminal, he found an empty gate and sat down. He stared up at the departure screen again. Who knows where I am now? He asked himself. A favorite question. Nobody. Nobody knows I'm here. It was amazing for him to think it had happened so quickly. This vanishing. No one knows where I am, he said again. He looked down at his phone as if to contemplate who could call from here, from this darkness. To awake himself in them with a sudden bullet of breathy, long sentence self-invention. The phone was an enormous, expensive, shiny white thing he got in the airport before leaving the land. Imagining something at once so vulgarly aspirational and business-like would be the most innocuous accessory you could have 
around the low life same time as you come in. Putting the phone back in his pocket, he got up, ravenous, and headed back to the food court area. Lovenously deliberating over where he was going to get a meal that he decided could be as expensive as he liked. With all the signs, fries, and trimmings, he didn't put it himself in the outside world. In the end, he eventually arrived at his own gate, only ten minutes or so before boarding. There wasn't a single free seat left in the waiting area, so he sat on the floor in the corner and again started to think. As he sat, trying to keep his back straight, eating the plain sandwich he decided on eventually, exhausted by imagining his perfect meal, he stewed on his own cowardice at going back. I've got the eyes of a coward, he thought, but if not. Anybody who has someone knows I'm always paying attention. Then he closed his eyes and imagined the artist he had admired, studied closely, tried to emulate on appropriate occasions, registering the contours of his decision making. He imagined the great ongoing process of decisiveness this person lived in. He imagined his decisiveness and he saw himself no longer going in this direction. Once established in the city, in the evening, after he got off from work, which more or less consisted of privileged, intelligent white people, speaking with intelligent Asian people, about what was theoretically happening to the city, and what theoretically could be done to it in an ideal world, he would let himself go, finding the places that were easiest to find. The bars he was expected to enter. The bars had the feeling, sickening, of having been discovered by almost every person with the same background as he would ever visit the city. At first, this meant just one or two bars, then in time, three or four, then five, before he hit a limit beyond which he was not easy to explore. So he alternated between the five bars. Not surprised to see how easily the people like him around, like him, but other people like themselves to speak with each night. People they already vaguely knew, friends of friends. Here, one night at one of these bars, the one closest to the port area, he overheard an Asian Australian man around his age, talking somewhat exasperated to a good-looking young white couple, also roughly the same age. Initially, the conversation sounded like the gossipy, scandalized, pseudo philosophy that inevitably comes out when creative people read the financial times. <laughs> the flagrant pragmatism of the articles, inspiring in them a series of sophisticated psychological insights regarding the dominant consciousness of the times. The couple continued trying to ask the young Asian man what he thought people there felt about what's happening. And Cola listened, his back to the room, staring at the plants illuminated by green and purple lights in each of the vast corners. Their conversation, particularly the couple's insistent questioning, made him remember why everyone loved coming to the city so much. That mental rush of thinking there was someone that was both overly speculated on and at the same time invisible, without an image. A pleasurable equation to thought with distaste. At some point, the Asian Australian, who from what was bothered with the was drinking far less than the others, despite their light mocking, said to them, you know I'm stuck here, don't you? They laughed. No, what? More laughter. When I first came here from Australia, it wasn't like I was coming home. I'd never been here before, or any brief, the family holidays, the usual, you know. So when I came here, it was like a foreign land to me, but like I was embarking on an adventure, a new adventure, but obviously I was better equipped than other foreigners who came here. I spoke the language, I looked Asian, and so on. So anyway, he continues, when I came here, because of these advantages, I thought it was a once in a lifetime opportunity to grapple with the concept of foreigners with these tools, with these advantages, ready to immediately note the difference in the smell of the air. I'm going to be poetic about it. I thought this was the one and only time I'd be so well equipped, and basically that I hadn't had to make the most of it. I felt under pressure. I kept saying to myself, this is your one and only shot. And what happened? Have you made it? Did you make it? Where are you now? The girl asked. The Asian Australian asked. And he said, I realize now that it's actually not something I have a single shot at. 
form that a single shot can be rushed, that won't get away from me, that I have no other ambitions than this one, that's probably going to be the ongoing search of my life, that feeling I had when I first got here, that it wasn't just some mysterio in my early 20s. I think I'm going to be here forever, with the same feeling I had when I got here, more or less, always dealing with the same problem. Again the girl, eager, jumping in his pause for breath through a sip of his drink, asked him another question, almost whining in her insistence on desiring the right answer. But what ambition? What do you mean this one ambition? The same feeling. He smiled again. First he said, I don't know. Then he said, to drift. The feeling of drifting. You call that? When you heard the word, heard a stab of panic. He wasn't going to move, but he felt cold all over. He was sweating, and it smelled particularly strong. Of all the toxins that hadn't been secreted since he last did any sport, months ago. When he heard the word, he remembered himself cut off from his own future. He wanted to turn around and see this man's face. To drift? Just to realize that you could stay on, he knew, residually, after something ends. Maybe not even as a residue of something of your own, but as a trace of anything you can find that has the potential for a residue. Maybe take on another job, remain unknown. Maybe never wake up again from this disturbed dream that began to take you over as you forgot or neglected your motives. Maybe slowly crumble in your mind, ambition dissipating into the landscape. I did not be humiliated by this failure, but instead be overjoyed that you found a way to do it so numbly, and at the same time so poetically. Drifting is basically, he thought, to disappear from a certain surface of life, the art of losing purpose. Because my articulacy is 
a major feature of my work. This is from Bad Reputations. No. Mona Lisa. I imagine my honey snatch, my flavor changes constantly. No Mona Lisa. I scroll like a sailor, bullets pass through me and I keep moving. No Mona Lisa, no sight long glance. Supposition, preposition, have no place in my communication. And when I talk, when I talk, when I talk, you know exactly what I mean. Mona Lisa has no mouth, no cunt, she stops at the waist. I hate that bitch, no Mona Lisa. I don't price down to review or go on sale, hey, no auction. I am no collector's item, no curator's pet, no Mona Lisa. I read the writing on the wall behind me, no Mona Lisa. I don't hang around, but if I have it for you, you are lucky. You can take it to the track, you can take it to the bank, you can deposit it, no Mona Lisa. I cannot be cataloged or dissertated. I cannot be viewed from a different angle. I cannot be seen in a different light. No Mona Lisa. No sidelong manipulation. I never had a father. I never learned how to be that kind of whore. You need a daddy to practice that kind of stalking. I was nobody's baby, nobody's angel, nobody's princess. I grew wild, uncultivated, ungroomed, unprotected, and unpromoted to a position of power. I know what you want, when you want it, how you want it. I can live without a sermon. My religion has no hope, no choir, no hope. I'm a loner. You are lucky. I never learned how to simmer contentedly. Fallen away. 
and I, you know, I hope that um, I wish and always want there to be more and more semiotext events in New York because we need it so badly here. So this next section hopefully will um, shed a lot of light because we'll get to hear directly from the master himself. I know he doesn't like being called that, but hey, he's still cute, so. <laughs> if you, you know, you can be a master if you can also be cute. You can't be cute with the top. Don't even bother. But, um, I know, I love you. But, one thing I'm saying now. David Morris and Silver, question and answer. David Morris was in London and is the co-editor of the Schizo Culture Box. Please welcome David Morris and Silver to the stage. in the French Department of Columbia and went on for two or three years uh, before, uh, before the Schizo culture came around. And uh, Schizo culture is important for me, not just for me, maybe, because it was the first break, the first crack, the first crack that it was irreversible. It projected us uh, not outside of academia, but uh, looking at academia at in a different way and also trying to join the artwork that was batting at the time. So, uh, Semiotex at the time was a magazine that many people may not know since we published books now, but the magazine may be existed, although we published here uh, one a, few, uh, a few issues here and there. Just to remind you that it's not, a, a, it's not by chance that we change. In fact, uh, Semiotex is all about change. Some change of the red snow can take 10, 20, 20, or 25 years, as a German, as an Italian issue shows. But the point is, uh, we try to constantly, constantly mutate in a very quiet way, without making a scandal, or with a, even a, not, making, not making sure that people notice it. We went from uh, publishing a magazine until 1983, uh, when the uh, downtown scene changed entirely, became a, neoliberally oriented, and uh, the magazine needs uh, close, we need like uh, readers, and we decided at that point to create, uh, to turn the magazine into books. Uh, the book started with French in 1983, uh, Audrey, which we read in here, uh, Donos and Guattari, that was the first uh, text for them that was published, and, uh, and then at the end of the 90s, uh, and I'm glad that uh, Pini Aklet uh, mentioned that, uh, uh, another person was added to the, to, the, to the committee, which had kind of split up in many ways and changed, and included at that point, uh, in 1990, uh, entirely new people uh, living with us or <coughs> working with us. And then uh, Chris Class uh, came first, and, uh, and we had uh, the, uh, she, she, uh, she showed me uh, something that I had noticed before, that most of the French theories that we published were male, and that uh, male and French, and then we looked for something else that would be some sort of equivalent in America when uh, the, the American art world was interested, was beginning to be interested in semiotics. But then we turned towards America and tried to look what would be American semiotics, right? And the American semiotics would be, we thought, the, the number of people, of writers and poets, was, uh, who are in the uh, you know, Low East Side and in the, the East Village, and uh, who took uh, in their hands to introduce a new kind of voice, a voice that was not mainstream, a voice that was not uh, self-congratulatory, but it was a voice of women who were not very well heard at the time. And women who were using the first person as a, as a way of struggling with the world outside. And for, for us, and for Chris, it, uh, 
it, 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 it makes sense that uh, we will add something. Instead of changing entirely, we have to go from one type of foreign agent of theory to another type of foreign agent that we call native agents. Native because they were born in, in the States. And that in a way, through fiction, we were trying to achieve something that was very uh, similar to what we were trying to achieve in theory. Another reason for that is that the French theory became so popular in the 80s that we didn't want, we didn't like so much the way it had been absorbed and uh, hadn't changed anything. So uh, what we tried to do is uh, get closer to America and make, make French theory come from an American source. Right? And then the, the little book became the big books and then in, uh, around two, uh, 2000 and some we had a third person who came to the, to the group because uh, uh, I, I thank Penny to have uh, honored me on that in some ways, but uh, it is similar that it is a group. And uh, I never come forward in the group, I think we always work together. And since the group is so small, uh, we never have a dissent between us, we never have group problems. Right? So uh, the third one was Hedy El Corti, El Corti, who is a Moroccan French, or French Moroccan, from the same. And uh, who is gay, and we introduced a third, third uh, uh, voice in, in this little group. You know, I was taking care of the French theory, Chris was taking care of American fiction, women mostly, but not exclusively. And then Hedy Corti introduced uh, another voice that came from the third world and also from the gay world. So, you see, slowly, without uh, any big revolution, we have mutated from uh, French to American, from American. Uh, women to American men, etc. And that was only the beginning. Uh, I talk about mutation very quickly because I don't want to take too much time. Because that's for me what uh, what French theory was about and what uh, Nietzsche was about, which was so important to French theory. The idea that you constantly have to change position. Uh, you have a perspectivist view of things. You never adhere to a ground. You just keep changing the ground, not just to change it. But just because you, you, you realize that if you don't change your ground, you're going to be caught by what exists around you. And that's not exactly what we're trying to do. So constantly, the idea that the semiotics became not a, a magazine or a book about theory, but it became theory. So that by, by doing what we do, we were very conscious that we were experimenting with a society that's around us, that we hope would be a schizo culture. And in some way, has become a schizo culture in a different way. We could talk about it. But the idea that constantly you have to evaluate the, the position you occupy at a certain time, in a certain place, in a certain country, and evaluate the, the active forces and the reactive forces that are, that, that, are, uh, are, that are playing around us. And always try to define, to find what is the, the active forces and disregard entirely what are the reactive ones. That's why I say. Uh, that semiotics is not a, a group of theory, it is, a, is someone who tried to, to experiment and to experience theory in a way that would be productive and active for the culture. Right. So, so here's, a, <laughs> here's David Morris, who's done an incredible amount of work uh, to get uh, this uh, uh, schizo-culture issue on the ground. And uh, so maybe I could ask uh, him what interested him into this project. Oh well, I I came across uh, the I came across the conference. Um, I forget where I read about it first, but I I came across it and and then I started digging and realised there was very little really out there about it. It seemed like such a phenomenal um, event, and you know the the kind of rumours and the myths that you you kind of picked up here and there uh, about the event seemed so kind of um, fascinating. And yet, in, in many ways, it was kind of it disappeared. It, was, it arrived at the wrong time, and, um, and it seemed to me when I when I first encountered it, I was just um, sort of baffled, or I, I wasn't sure why this, you know, why why have I never heard of this? Why is no one talking about this thing? That kind of, and I think the thing the thing that strikes me about it now is really when you were doing it, it was it was like like you say, a laboratory. You were combining these forces and seeing without any particularly clear idea of what, you know, what was going to happen. It was um, a group uh, at the time, you and, uh, you and John and uh, the, other, the other people in the Columbia department, and you had 
this idea to kind of connect some wires between between the United States and um, uh, these French thinkers that you know um, were very um, you know doing very similar work at the time, and you know seeing seeing what seeing what would come up there. I think the sense of moving into the unknown is um, what really drew, which is drew me to yeah, <laughs> which is like and um, so this yeah this idea of you know young young John Rathman and young young Silver going in um, going into Colombia and kind of setting these these thinkers up and you know not not having a particularly clear idea of how it was going to play out and in the end uh, I know it began to snowball and you know there was there was all this hype around it and then it became a, an entirely different thing but I think um, you know I'm not sure even now do you, do you have a sense of you know you had no sense at the time of what it was going to become and I wonder if looking back now it makes it makes more sense. Yeah, I hope so. That's why we, that's why we published it, but it's not, it, it, I wondered about it because I didn't want it to be only something that, uh, that was uh, crucial for me because it, that it did change my life. It's not, uh, it, it put me on a new, a new tracks and I think uh, I tried not to, to change the tracks but not to change the, the inspiration that came with it. Uh, you said that, um, that it was too early, but in a sense it wasn't too early, it just took a shortcut. You know, at that time, uh, when we organized the Skito Culture, John and I, we were in France and we were getting, we were getting to know uh, the French scene, you know, the Leuze, the Gabi, Foucault, Lacan, and, uh, and working with them in some ways. And the idea came to, uh, to just, uh, you know, bring theory back to the States. Right? Uh, I went at that time, I, I made the tour of Nagelo Presses in New York, and I said, look, we have something very interesting, and if you want to finance a magazine, we're going to advise you on that. <laughs> but they didn't buy it, they said, no, 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 it's too specialized, it won't work. So we decided, you know, we're going to do ourselves. And that's exactly what we've been all, all along. We never, we have a job with the matter, we, we have 10 people in the group at the beginning, we have $50 each, and at least $500, we, we created something that took us supposedly here for 40 years. So the idea is like, okay, we will, more American than American, and I think let's try. Let's try having the French come here and, and tell by themselves you know, what they are about. Of course, most of these people were not known in this country, the laws that was known, but I mean, not at all. Foucault was just beginning to, to be known, but not for his major text that came uh, slightly after, uh, this is in Polish, uh, one of those. And uh, the book, Spito uh, Kultus, not, not Spito Culture, but the uh, Anti Antidepus was uh, translated in uh, 1970. So basically, it's not that we are in, in a too early, it's that uh, we made we a shortcut. We didn't know exactly uh, what would happen. Uh, I knew people from the village voice, so they, they, we had a pick of the week that uh, it was a, a, a conference on semiotics. And it's true that the group of the group of semioticians to start with, but by the time, by the time the conference uh, happened, we had already moved into something else entirely. Right? And uh, the magazine were kept trying to catch up with us, with where we were. So uh, the, the, the conference, as I was going to say a few words about, uh, was also a total, uh, a total surprise. In a sense, uh, it was totally unexpected, or entirely a uh, Entirely because we, we expected the, the conference to be like, a, you know, to have an audience of 50 or 60 people, which is mostly what happens in academia, and you know, highly financed by this and that, but you end up having just a, a handful of people who listen and on top of those who participate. So we, ex we expect it to, to be something very manageable, but uh, uh, we didn't we begin to, to realize that things were moving when the, the telephone kept ringing for, for, for one month and asking what it is and where is it and etc. And we had to switch the, the room that we had, uh, which is a you know, middle sized room, to a teacher's college where we had a, a room that would house uh, a thousand people or so. So uh, the, the four day conference uh, snowballed, as you said, uh, while it was happening. And what was happening is that uh, there were uh, different constituencies who were there. Uh, Jean Jacques Lebel uh, was giving uh, a radio, uh, radio program uh, at uh, WBAI. Every night, I'd say, 
this is going to be anarchy, please come, want to create your own, uh, your own uh, conference, uh, get your uh, workshop in the halls, etc. Others, uh, you know, others, uh, other constituencies were more academic, the people who were, you know, more Marxist than we were, and, uh, oh no, yes, more Marxist than we were, and uh, <laughs> other <laughs> things. It was a confrontation between a certain type of uh, social thinking and another one. Not antagonistic at all, but if you want, uh, we were Marxists who uh, were taking Marx by the hand and said, okay, let's move, let's mutate for a century and uh, let's catch up with it. Right? And for us, uh, thinking beyond Marx or with Marx was just a way of uh, not just understanding what, uh, what Marx was about, but on the contrary, to just put Marx to the turn, to, 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 touch, to task and see exactly what falls and what doesn't hold. And not just to, by thinking, but just experimenting uh, along the way, right? So there was uh, this uh, various group, political, radical, we, we, our, our audience grew a bit later because by moving downtown we had a lot of uh, uh, presence among the pre punks and punks and, uh, and a downtown crowd and that's some club, the French club. In a way, I could say that uh, if we innovate uh, you know, many things, that we wanted to mix, to mix the low and the high, the downtown and the uptown, the, 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 the theorist and the artist. That was uh, this kind of a, a real melting pot, as it doesn't always happen in the state, and we try to do it. You know, try more melting pot in America now. Okay. I think, I think this um, untimeliness that you were talking about, I mean, the thing that strikes me is now it sort of makes a lot more sense than it you know, ever could at the time, you know, the Cage and, you know, the Burroughs and Miami Dillers and Co um, and then the, the anti-psychiatry and the prisons movement and all these things kind of, you know, they're very disparate, very different languages of uh, thought and they came together at the time and they clashed and they argued and they, they couldn't stand one another and they all fought. Um, whereas, you know, today it's sort of, it all hangs together, and this this is why it feels to me like it arrived early, or it arrived, at, you know, it arrived uh, it shortcutted to, you know, kind of uh, a more, um, as Penny was saying, a more like cracked or uh, dispersed um, form of culture. In, in a sense, what happened is that we, you know, many of the things that we did have only discovered retrospectively that they were philosophical. But what we did is what uh, Deleuze would call addition, you know, A and 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 we have madness, but it's not all about madness. We had a, we had a, a prisons, but it was not all about prison. We had art, but it was not about art only, etc. So that by adding things, and the, the magazine itself is done in this way, you know, it's, a, it's a collage, it's an addition, and we, we, we make sure that there is a, a some sort of a resonance between them. We don't have to spell out, we didn't want to be academic and write you know, a whole article about what we're doing. We just were putting things together and hoping that people would that perceive something, a crack in between the images, between the text, and we to make their own reflection. You know, academia, what they don't like about academia, always want to tell you what, uh, what you should think about. And we always try to put things in such a way that the question were raised and not, not uh, initiated. And that people could uh, find their way through it the way that they would find their way through life, because we didn't know exactly how things are going to turn out. And, uh, uh, we talked, I talked about earlier of an event, and I think retrospectively also, I realized that uh, the Senior Peck started in the middle and not at the, at the beginning. Also, that uh, an event is something that you never perceive when it is happening. And uh, it's only afterwards that you begin to see it when it's maybe too late, in between not that event contain a multiplicity of things. Right? And you don't exactly know which one you are going to work and which one are not going to work. And I think what didn't work for us was French theory. <laughs> French theory didn't work because it became, a, a, when, when, a, when I arrived in the States, uh, in New York, more exactly, uh, artists were very anti-intellectual. You know, I had to hide the theory. I had to uh, renounce everything I knew about concepts. I had to learn how to, to talk like anyone else. Right? And I, I wanted I want stimulants to be that, to be read by anyone in the subway, uh, you know, without having anything, any, any knowledge of theory. And if they didn't understand, it didn't matter. 
Yeah. You just open the book and you start reading. That's also what I, I advise my students. The class say, don't start something at the beginning because then if you don't understand, you feel stupid. Yeah. But if you open it in a, anywhere, then if you don't understand, of course you don't understand because you have to read the beginning. <laughs> so write down, take your time, don't worry. Uh, go around, go in front, go in back, uh, try to make your own theory without maybe uh, uh, swallowing even the advice of those who, uh, who, who, who would like to introduce something more linear. See? So when we were adding things, it meant that we were resisting dialectics, uh, compromise, uh, synthesis, and all that. We wanted the, the strength of each element to bounce back against the other element. That was the idea. And this uh, I'll, I'll stop here for the moment, but uh, the idea of, uh, of event is important because an event means that uh, it's like something happens out of a situation and then, as I said, friendship became too popular. We didn't know what to do about it. And uh, in fact, say we have to defend free series, not to use right away, da, da, da. I knew at that time that I knew enough uh, about New York and, and the state at that time to know that you don't stop things. You just stand on the side. You just uh, switch the emphasis. You wait. You, you, you let the, 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 the horse go galloping on its side, and then you are some, somewhere else in another position. You know, again, Nietzsche. In another position from which you can look at things differently. And time is not, really, is, is not uh, the important thing. Although everything goes so far, so fast, in fact, it doesn't go fast enough. Mm -hmm. no. If you take a, a position, it constantly shifts so that uh, you know exactly what is going to be beneficial or not. Then you may have the chance to resist it without, without uh, uh, starting a class struggle or without uh, uh, creating a party. You can be much more efficient by keeping something alive than by you know, beating to death uh, ideas that, are, that either were not understood or, or, or have become solid. So again, what I, what, what I thought about the the, the, the Skipper culture issue precisely that it was a real departure, that the departure, some of it was wasted. I mean, not entirely because uh, it influenced the art world and it influenced the academia and say it's a waste, but we didn't want, you know, for this to be commented, to get uh, curators to curate it, uh, to get uh, critics to comment upon it. We wanted something that was much more American. She's a, know how, know the hand to mouth, uh, try to survive and, and create a life, not just for us, but for the magazine that would be worth living. It seemed like a very difficult task. Uh, and I think that with schizoculture, instead of uh, turning back on schizoculture as something of the past, with schizoculture is something new, that's why I call it the return of schizoculture. We have wasted so much of our lives, we have let ourselves be caught into the, the, the flows of capitalism. We have been to, you know, so that we, we, now we don't have any life anymore. We're just uh, juggling from one electronic uh, toy to another electronic toy. We don't, we're not in control of anything. They are in control of us, right? So I think that schizo culture is something of the present. And maybe uh, it, it may be an event if people can think a bit of what, uh, what we were coming with and what happened to it, but also what could happen to it. Yeah, right, it came together. Left so much unfinished that could be picked up, you know, or extended, or um, repeated, or done in a different way. I think the way, you know, the way it collapsed, or the way the way it produced all these different um, these different uh, tensions or fractures within, um, you know, these these groups and um, parties with common interests, but very you know, disparate ways of ways of approaching them or coming at them just, uh, you know, produced a very fertile moment. I think that's why, why coming back to it just, you know, keeps getting, keeps on, because uh, it, 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 it never really makes sense, I don't think, or, it never, it, it's never like, it's never quite congealed, as, as coherent as maybe it seems, I mean, coming back to it now, you know, you can have the benefit of 40 years or so on. It never really quite match up, the pieces won't glue. I don't think it should be glue. <laughs> But we have to reflect a bit on what's happening. The Douglas Monterey were in fact behind the schizo culture. They introduced the idea that uh, the schizo is not, uh, is not an individual of the crisis, but this is a model of capitalism itself. Right? It is a capitalist that uh, plays with extremes, that constantly 
push your thing to the to the utmost, and then somehow don't go as far as you could. Like take the, the last uh, crisis, financial crisis. Well, I was wondering if it was going to go all the way. No, it didn't go all the way. You know, when when capitalists like a, a capitalist uh, made a new form of a, of a collective money, which was to extract it from the from the from the government or from the government, and then uh, it, it, it impoverished the whole world. But everyone who was part of it was, was pretty much safe and and uh, and, uh, and profited from it. So the point is, you, you know, in a society like ours, which is a mosquito culture society, also things are too dispersed, too dispersed to, uh, for anyone to really stand on one position. You constantly have to go to the extreme. That's that's uh, schizophrenia. But you have also to to make sure that you don't go to something that should be like a uh, uh, the end of the the end of the of, of the earth or the end of the world, right? Which is where we're probably going to uh, uh, pretty fast. Uh, no, the, what we thought was was little culture is that going to the extreme, we have to match capitalism in in in, uh, in substance and in, in essence, in its movement. If capitalism instead of being made of classes that clash and Whatever classes, whatever classes we take over, now capitalism has invaded everything. It's invaded everyone's mind. Every day, it invaded every everyone's life. So the problem is what to do. What can we do against it? But not against it. How could we redirect some forces which are just important and active, even uh, electronically? And how to live in an electronic world where with all the flows uh, that uh, circulate around us are there? And on the one hand, to liberate us, but also to prevent us from having a, a life. But the problem that they raise is what kind of subjectivity is being created by capitalism. And we know now that the subjectivity created by capitalism is an individual. It is a neoliberal individual, someone who is supposed to, to uh, have initiative by initiative for what? For doing exactly what anyone else could do. Right? So the, the individual that's been created by, by capitalism he should learn something about schizophrenia. In other words, learn how not to be afraid of life, not to be afraid of making any move that would be unexpected and would be somewhere else. We, we should realize that uh, we, have, we have to take our life in our hand because if we don't take it in our hand, well, someone else will do it. Of that uh, actual discussion, 
so that you could listen to me first and then talk. Qui m'emporte Tu devras me payer. Et si c'est toi qui m'emporte, tu devras me payer. And Protagoras answers him, anyway, you owe me my fees, because in our case, if you knew I die, if I win, you will owe me the money. If I lose, you will have won the case, and you will owe me the money anyway. Dans cette réponse de Protagoras, Thank <laughs> you. 
is in this case. Protagoras is making the money. That's that's the point. Okay? Now I'm serious about this. Yeah. You're wrong. <laughs> and me too. But yeah. we're both good, aren't we? <laughs> but Toulouse gave a lecture in French, but like he gave a lecture to, to children. You know, as if children understood the language, he speaks slowly. So, so he spoke very slowly while drawing, uh, drawing some graphs about uh, his own uh, on a blackboard. Uh, uh, John Cage uh, read from uh, his own interpretation uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, Joyce's uh, Finnegan Twig. Right. which was a language that no one understood in any case. <laughs> so the, 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 the frustration, see it's not the frustration, but everyone had to somehow you know, find their way into that. It was a series of different interventions, but they didn't quite cohere. You know? uh, Foucault was supposed to talk at the same time as, uh, as William Burroughs, but Foucault talked in the afternoon because the, 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 the audience split in two, in the middle, because uh, Guattari had enough of uh, hearing English, which he didn't understand, and he said, "Okay, want to summarize the original lecture in five minutes, and then we can talk, right?" So half of the audience said, "No, no, no, no! He prepared the lecture. He has to keep his lecture." The other said, "Oh, you know, enough of this. So let, 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 we should stick with Akati. We don't want people to give the commentaries." So they moved to another space where Guattari and uh, and Foucault gave another. Uh, we never talk, which was interrupted this time by people from the Gustave Larouche, 
uh, who accused uh, Foucault of being paid by the CIA. And then again, we have a scandal. Uh, you see that it was constantly a uh, mis uh, misunderstanding, but it never was a dialogue. Uh, and as uh, 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 Deleuze often says, no, a dialogue means dialectic. It means trying to want to smooth the, to smooth the, the, the unfortunate. You know? But you know, then it's like the way the historian talk about history. When they smooth out history, so that nothing is surprising. It was always written from the back by those who won. And what we wanted to do, and the same with the, with the skill of culture, was to, to leave cracks where they are to try to see which one leads, uh, leads in, um, an interesting life and life, and what does lead into an interesting one, life. So, you see, uh, imagine being exposed to, for two or three days to this kind of lecture with translation, translation. The translation itself, it, means to, it, it seems to me, we're doing exactly what, what the schizophrenics do. You, know? they, you, you want to, to tell me what, what this guy says? Well. Let's really tell you what he says, right? And it escalates, and it becomes uh, some sort of a delirium of its own, you know? A delirium without an object, because really, Lyotard uh, was trying his best to give the lecture as a translator presentative. So see, this is a paradox, and paradoxes are something to be welcomed. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and uh, cracks are something to be, to be uh, interested in, and not something that you have to, to, to cut over. John is here, and I asked John to come, just because uh, the experience we had with that senior text, and we still have the senior text, uh, has something to do with uh, trying to break, to, to lose the head of the individual, right? And uh, John made a film. Actually, I don't want to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea. <laughs> but the question is that uh, we, we worked in some sort of group that was not a group. Right? And I, I think I asked uh, John to come tonight because he's always he's involved with a group that is not just a group. Right? I want to talk about it. <laughs> it's okay, right? Do I have to? Really? Can I ask you something? <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious, like you brought all these people over from France, um, Foucault, the Leotard. What kind of host were you, or, or how, how was it for you when they got here in terms of um, the situation you set up them with? Did they feel like I do now? <laughs> <laughs> how do you feel like? <laughs> But they, they came on the spot too. They came on the spot too. Foucault was furious, furious at the organizers. I had him uh, outside uh, on the, the sidewalk of the teacher's college for, for about four or five hours. He was totally delirious. You know, he was he was embodying the schizophrenic culture comfort. He said this thing. Well, he, he said this is the worst audience I've seen in my life. New York is unbearable, you know, and don't count on me tomorrow to, uh, to attend the panel with Ron Lang, uh, to his RD Lang. Uh, uh, this, is, this is a shameful, etc. Et and then he left. But that night, World Coros was, was talking. He came, he came back just for that. He came just to, to say one sentence to introduce Burroughs. And he said, look, uh, I'm not going to, 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 to dare speak when Burroughs could speak now. Here is I present Mr. William Burroughs. So here I present Mr. Uh, John Cassidy. <laughs> That's such a dirty trick. <laughs> uh, uh, so, Foucault really gave his place up to Burroughs. <laughs> what, what he did is uh, be present. And of course, the new Burroughs, and like uh, many people in Europe, uh, people in Europe was very. Uh, 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 was, was very uh, thrilled by the by, by the Burroughs book and by uh, the Burroughs act, if you want. And uh, that's what one of the surprises I saw in the state. Uh, in the state, Burroughs was considered an asylum. He has been there for. Uh, uh, he, he was. A, he has his, his minute of fame 
in the, in the 50s, and that's it, it was over. In America, you change things very fast. And uh, part of what we're doing is that, you know, Burroughs was an event in the culture. And we gathered the whole underground culture around the Burroughs in the 1968, 1678. <laughs> 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 yeah, there was everyone, you know, from Laurie you know, uh, Anderson to, uh, to Paddy Smith, to Frank Zappa, to John Joe, to the Beats, etc. But Burroughs is such a that he told me, well, that to, to convince him that, that everyone would mobilize for Burroughs. Because precisely Burroughs was an event in the culture, but America had already forgotten about it. See? So in a, in a culture where everything would go very fast, uh, it didn't change Burroughs to Burroughs. He just went to Europe and he waited. He was just coming back when they just called him and said, Would you like to talk? See, you have the unexpected is what you know, is important. You know, because you don't even know yourself what's going to happen. And then something can happen that you control, you don't control, that uh, something is alive. And the hope of the, the, the downtown, uh, the underground, the American uh, culture was there to, to, to pay, not to pay their respect to, to Boros, but just to be side by side with Boros and do what they do usually, you know, their own stuff. You know, you answer creation by creation, you don't comment to comment. You don't explain it, you know, you do it. It was nice. <laughs> <laughs> What's next is that we have a surprise is that uh, my friend uh, Michel uh, Rosenfeld is here and he happened to have been one of the three translators of that session for Toyota. So I ask him to join a, a, a discussion, it's not a dialogue. <laughs> It's very nice to be here. It really uh, brings me back almost 40 years now, and uh, I was very happy when the CVAP contacted me. I mean, totally different uh, end of life, although I'm still an academic. Uh, and um, I don't quite remember the translation thing, but what I do remember, which is very interesting because it feeds into all this, was the different expectations. Uh, I was in, in the philosophy department as a student. Uh, I, I liked it. I was one of those graduate students that are listed. Uh, when I saw the room in the Whitney Museum, I saw your name and I thought, here, here is your bad. Or other people I knew at the time. And then there was a, a little uh, generic uh, title underneath it. I said, it's the first time I got into the Whitney Museum, but my name didn't get into it. But it's okay. Uh, in any event, uh, the, the story I want to tell about this is uh, it also has to do with translation, but in a different sense is uh, the expectation on both sides uh, of the Atlantic. And I dealt more with the American because I was uh, a liaison at the time with Arthur Dato, who was my teacher in philosophy, who, by the way, bridged, later would bridge uh, the divide between art and uh, philosophy, but at the time was uh, just one of the superb analytic, American analytic philosopher. And he was very excited that the French were finally turning to practicalism very abstract French theory that nobody understands, but the, 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 the buzz was that all the French were coming to really meet the Americans because they're both now into pragmatism. And forget the translation into French. Uh, pragmatism uh, for Americans and for the French people at the time, and I think it's still the same today, by the way, uh, was such different things that I remember having a conversation after the conference with Dante saying, why do they call themselves pragmatism? It has nothing to do with it. So, uh, this is just to show that the problem of translation went from the very uh, concrete, physical, mis I was not, by the way, the one mistranslating <laughs> the story of Pythagoras, because uh, even then I, was, I already graduated law school, so I understood the, the, the legalism that uh, that Piotr was trying to work around. But, in any event, it, it happened at all levels, but uh, connections were made, and uh, one of the things that I got out of this, now let me do this, is that in my own career as a law professor, which may sound very boring to a crowd south of uh, uh, Washington Square, but in any event, uh, I have still been playing the, the both cultures and trying to understand uh, how a legal system in one culture misunderstands another, and as we're moving to a globalized world, we have more and more cross-reference. But what I learned in this ESO conference, uh, 
was that uh, the same problem, the same issues continue even in very different uh, areas of life 40 years later. Thank you very much for allowing this viewing. I'm very happy that I'm here.